So we're rolling. <laughs> and uh, he's crazy. <laughs> he's bringing out the balloons. Okay, okay let's go. Yeah. All right. So uh, I, I think probably talk to me. Yeah. If if that works for you. I'll talk to you. I'll look at you. Yep. Sure. So Mark, thank you very much for agreeing to um, to sit down and do this interview. Yeah. It's going to be a short one, but I hope some of the questions will be ones you haven't heard before. Okay. Can you recall your first experience of kayaking? Uh, yes, I can. I bought a tandem kayak because I wanted to uh, spend more time with my son, who was 10, 10 at the time. And we went on our first tour, and that's the first memory of uh, kayaking and tenting. And we tented in a major, major thunderstorm. And we only kayaked probably two, three kilometers. Um, but that was the beginning of my kayaking is I, I wanted to spend more time with my son who is, uh, yeah, I wanted good memories. Good. You know, I, I had very much the same experience with my younger son when uh, we were on holiday together and the opportunity to try diving occurred. Yes. And yeah. everything just went bad after that. <laughs> so that, that, that's wonderful. When did you buy your first kayak? I bought my first kayak around, I would think, around 12 years ago. And that, that was my first kayak. I, I, I had never kayaked before. So the only, the only reason was uh, I believe in, in life that there's just two things in life that are really important for me. And number one is faith. And that means what is your why? What's your purpose? Why are you, why are you here? That, and that's some people, have their faith is God. Other people, their, their faith may be philanthropy, other things that they're involved in. So, so that's important. Then the second is just to create good memories. I'm, I'm a simple type of guy. So I, I wanted to create good, good memories with my children. And um, unfortunately, my wife, she passed away from cancer uh, 10 years ago. And then those good memories became even more important. And being out in nature, um, it's, it's, uh, other people turn to artificial stimulants. But when you're in nature, it's, it's, like, it's like an antibiotic. It, you don't notice that you're getting healed, but you, it's a slow process where nature, it's, it's an in, innate within us. And once you unite with nature, something happens with, with you, your mind and your body. And I wanted my son also to, to feel that. <laughs> I don't know if he has or not. <laughs> well, well t time will tell and whether or not he, um, he emulates you in the years ahead. That's correct, yeah. He, he's got a few years to wait. He's got a few years, yeah. yeah. So you previously paddled... Um, if I understand correctly, about four years ago, yes, from the capital of Norway, Oslo, correct, to the capital of Greece, Athens, through the rivers and canals of Europe. That's correct. What lessons from that trip <clears throat> have you been able to apply to this particular one? Ah, oh, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, some of the lessons that I learned from that trip are basically never make decisions from a distance. You've got to get close up to where you're going before you make a decision. For example, I would look at a map, and, but in the horizon, it would just be one line of land. But I knew that if I got closer, there should be a, a passage. And sometimes I, I, was, wasn't, I was like maybe 200 meters from that passage, I couldn't see it. But that is, never make decisions based on distance. You got it as close as you can to to where you are. And it's the same thing in business. The same thing with when I'm working with my, my employees is that with there's a conflict, never make a decision, never try and solve a solution until you get as close as you can to, to where you are. Now that, that was one, one of the things. And then the second thing is uh, be prepared. And one of the things about fear that I've learned a lot is that you need a skill set. You need to have a skill set under your belt in order to minimize fear. Because regardless of how much you plan, two things are going to happen. Number one, you need to be safe, and the skill sets you have as a kayaker enable you to be safe. And number two, you're going to get into trouble. It's, it's inevitable. When I kayaked from Oslo to Athens, 6,000 kilometers, trouble was inevitable. It was just a matter of time, even though I prepared myself and I was as careful as so much as I could be, it was inevitable. And the third thing, 
I, I learned about this tour was that people are good. There's a goodness in practically everyone. And I met people who cried because they didn't have enough money to give me something. I met people who allowed me to stay on their boat and, you know, the canal boat. And they said, oh, we're just so sorry. We're just so sorry that we weren't able to, to, to give you something. I said, listen, you've given me everything. I've had a chance to live on your boat for three days. And people all over the world would pay hundreds of dollars just to do that. So people are good. People are generous. And if you're approachable with people, you'll find that there's a goodness that's shared between humanity. And... Uh, no matter if you're rich or if you're poor, everybody brings something to the table, and everybody is worthwhile. Everyone. Great, great lessons for, for all of us to learn. Yeah. Now you've you've you mentioned a moment ago, business. Yes. But it may occur to some, hearing about your travels, that you were perhaps a member of the Norwegian Special Forces. <laughs> can, can you tell us something about your professional life, if you're able to? <clears throat> My professional life is very diverse. Um, when I was 11 years old, I lived in Verdun, Manitoba. And we went down to Bellingham, Washington, and we went to a park where there was a lake. And the, um, at this lake, there was a wharf, like a horseshoe wharf, a pier. And at the end of the pier, there was a diving board. And I saw all the kids jumping off this diving board, right? They were having a great time laughing and making big splashes. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. And I was really good at the trampoline. So, and really good at jumping. So I went to the diving board and I hopped off into the cold water, but I couldn't swim. I couldn't swim. And I was thrashing about and then somebody got a hold of me and dragged me and, and another person lifted me onto the pier as water came out of my lungs. And they said, what are you doing? You shouldn't do that. You can't swim. And with my business life, I've always jumped in to do something. If the door opened, I just jumped in. I, I, I've never looked at the consequences. I've never been fearful about failing. I've never been fearful about, about winning. I've just jumped in. So my, my professional career, I'm educated as a journalist and a, in communication. So I've worked with, as a ship insurance broker, uh, um, you know, insuring large tanker ships, mm -hmm. chemical carriers, car carriers. And then from there, I applied for a position in Lloyd's in London as a Scandinavian shipping correspondent. So I begin to write and uh, articles and interview companies. And then from there, I, I started my own shipping magazine. And I launched the shipping magazine in Yokohama, Japan at a trade show. And I, I you know... It was, it was in the good old days, right? I took three suitcases, and two of the suitcases were just full of magazines. And I got around, I think I got around two kilometers from the, from the trade show, and I couldn't pull them anymore. I couldn't care. My arms, were just to <laughs> My arms were just totally weak. And I had to get a taxi the last two kilometers. But, and then from there, it went into public relations. So I used all the contacts that I had, and I've been doing public relations for the uh, shipping and off international shipping and offshore industry for uh, 30 years. And I have uh, a small set of employees uh, and I call them love refugees because they're, they're, they're expats in Norway and they speak great English. You know, there's from New York, Manchester, uh, Australia, Seattle, London. Um, yeah, they come from all over the place. And I, I love my work. But yet, it's just a matter of jumping into what you're doing and to say, I'm going to do it. Right. I'm going to go for it. Well, you know, it's, it's no surprise to hear that you have a background in journalism. Because I understand you're, you're keeping a, a video log. Yes. And uh, you're going to produce a book after this trip. I, but we'll, we'll come back to that, if, okay. if we may. Yeah, okay. So just, just going back to equipment, besides your kayak, which yes. is clearly essential... What's the one piece of equipment that's proved to be most valuable to you? Yeah. Without a doubt, it's my iPhone. On my iPhone, I have my weather apps. I have my tide apps. I have everything that I need, my, my, my maps. So everything is on my iPhone, and I use my iPhone for all my films, plus my drone. Uh, I, the, the phone is essential. We live in a modern, uh, modern technology. 
Um, if I had done this 20 years ago, I would have to have a full set of charts and maps, and it would have made it that much more difficult. On the iPhone, I just go onto Google Maps, and I see my location, and I see where I'm going to go, and I just move my iPhone, and the arrow points there, and I paddle there, and there's the opening, there's the passage, there's the route I need to take. Coming through the Riddle Canal, some of those areas you're going through, you know, um, Jones Falls, uh, or yeah, it's Jones Falls, I'm not sure what it's called. You know, all these places. Smith Falls, maybe. Smith Falls. All those places, they're, they're intricate. And if you mm -hmm. didn't have a, a compass, like a, an iPhone with the charts mm -hmm. or the, the map, you, it would be difficult. So have you, have you used any of the, um, the applications that offer charting, like Navionics or any of the others? No, I, the, I've mostly used, uh, it's, it's a fisherman's app. So it shows me the, the depths and the rocks. That was mostly for the St. Lawrence. Yep. So I, I used that reg regularly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in, in, in something of the same vein, you, you're now, you left Halifax in June, I believe? The 2nd of June I left Halifax. Right, and, and you're, you're, you aim to be finished within a year. I hope to be finished within a year. Because I, I understand from talking to you earlier that you're going back for your son's graduation. From I the university, want... your youngest son. Yes, correct. Um, but, but you've now got, I, I don't know how many kilometres, perhaps you can tell us, behind you? Yeah, I've, um, I've paddled 69 days. Right. And I don't know how many of those days have been off days, but they're just paddling days. So I left the 2nd of June, and now we're approaching uh, September mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's, it's yeah, 2,400, around 400 kilometers paddled okay. so far. And that's a, I don't think anybody's paddled Halifax, uh, right. Kingston before. No, no, I, I, I don't imagine it's commonplace. No. But, but in the same vein as the last question, what's the most valuable piece of equipment besides your kayak, obviously? What's the one thing that you've discovered that you really should have brought with you and you miss not having? Oh, wow. Um, long distance kayaking is about, it's about a couple things. Number one, it's weight, right? It's weight. It, you have to have low weight as much as you can because every time you take that paddle and you draw it back, it's weight. And after you, sometimes I sit in a kayak, you know, I paddle 20 kilometers to begin with in the morning. And by that time, you know, your bum is getting sore, you're, you're, you're starting to feel it, you've got to get out of the kayak. So weight is a big issue. I, I, I wish I had a trolley because in the Rideau Canal, I could have gone around the locks a, a bit quicker. Uh, but that's, I've looked at this route, and it's not too often that I need a trolley. So, and that was a weight issue. That was a decision because a trolley, it takes, it takes room. And when I kayak, I like to have a clean kayak on, on the deck because if you get into bad weather and, you know, you can capsize, and if, the, if you don't achieve the, the roll, um, then you've got to get out. And if you have a, you know, something on the deck behind you, or for, sometimes it's very difficult. So, but I, I don't think there's anything that I, I really miss. Maybe a coffee maker would be nice. Oh, co coffee's critical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to almost all of us. So, I mean, you, you're, you're maybe two and a half thousand kilometers into this trip, which is, I think, 10,000 kilometers? Yeah, it's uh, close to 10,005. Okay. Could be 11,000 if it's... So, so uh, I mean, th those are figures that, that it's easy. They, they trip off the tongue very easily. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, the... the the, un the, the appreciation of what that means in, in sheer you know, willpower and Correct. muscle power is, yeah. is extraordinary. Now, you, you, you mentioned that you know, your bum hurts now and again, and, and that's entirely understandable. I mean, you, half your weight is, is, is sitting on it most of the day. <laughs> but I, I think what many people would wonder about is your hands. Yes. Because I think um, paddling and, and, and kayaking, it's very often the hands that suffer. Yeah. How, how have you come um, for that? Well, you know, first there's around uh, three layers of, of calluses that you get. So the first, the first layer of calluses are going to be here. Second layer of calluses are going to be here. And then you get another callus here where, you know, on both sides. So mm -hmm. this is quite... Um, yeah, you have to be nimble. Yeah. You have to be nimble. And, and, and I notice, and, and, and viewers will, that 
you, your paddle's a fairly low profile paddle. Yes. I mean, you, you, you're not swinging a big blade. No. And, and presumably that's helpful. Yes, I use a, mostly I use what's called a Greenland paddle, and it's an elongated uh, paddle. Yeah. And it's basically because it's, it's the normal paddles you have, when you dig into the, you know, into the water, it, it demands more. It demands mm. more energy, more power. But this one, once you get going, then it's very relaxing. Um, and it's good for your body. So it, it doesn't dig into your, the muscular system. So the, so, so the issue is momentum, not torque. The, the issue is momentum. You yeah. keep the momentum. And, 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 and you're, you're running um, which brand of kayak? I, I, it's an English-made kayak called NDK okay. by Nigel Dennis, and it's a, wow, is it ever a stable kayak. Uh, I was in a Gale Force 5 wind crossing Nova Scotia to New Brunswick, and I ran into real, real difficulty. I couldn't get across, and I couldn't go back, so I just had to go with the wind and angle my way to shore, which mm -hmm. took around between one and a half and two hours to do that. Um, in that episode, I felt like a, a rubber duck in a washing machine. I didn't capsize. No. Um, the, the kayak uh, was fabulous. It's the most stable kayak I've ever owned. And when I got across the shore and I got on land, I, I cried. And, and, and yet, you, you, you make a point of stressing how, how stable the kayak is. And it's 18 feet long. Correct. Um, it, it's a fairly narrow kayak. Yes. So, you know, the stability is, is surprising. It's surprising, but when you load a kayak, what's most important, you, you are the center of gravity, mm -hmm. right, where you sit. So it's important to load right at your feet that, that cargo hold there. You put the heavy stuff right close to your feet, and then behind you, where there's the mid hatch and the back hatch, you put the heavy stuff. So what happens is that the lighter part of the kayak is at the ends, and the heavy is is a ballast, mm -hmm. and that ballast you can really, really uh, manage. I, actually, I could manage all weather. Um, you know, if, if there were, let's say, 15 meter waves, you could actually manage that, because if you just sit there and just go up and down, you're gonna, it, you can do it, as long as they're not crashing over you from the side, right, <laughs> and they're not right. breaking. Yeah, yeah. So the kayak is a really fantastic yeah. machine. And, and I assume that you've, um You've determined by, by trial and error to some extent over, over the previous voyage and, and this one correct just how to load for best efficiency yeah you, um, you, you, you know that you've got to pack correctly and uh, usually you know you, you get off the kayak and you lift it up and you see okay which side is is, is heavier you need, you need to adjust mm -hmm. where the weight is even on the sides because you know, if there's too much weight on one side, then, then the key will automatically go that, uh, yeah. that direction. Yeah. So it's, it's weight. Weight is a, an issue, and placement of, of the goods, placement of your gear yeah. and equipment, it's really important. So in, weight, in weight distribution and balance. Weight distribution it, I mean, is key. It's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, it's almost aircraft-like, where, <laughs> where balance is extremely important. But, but before we finish, if, if someone was looking for advice as they considered an adventure like yours, yeah. your second one, um, what's the most important thing you would tell them? Wow. I, I, would, I would tell them to, to be calm in every situation. Some of the things that have been the most, uh, I don't know if you say mental or psychological draining, is that being, where, where am I going to stay tonight? Am I going to find a safe haven? When I paddled through Europe, I never camped uh, close to the city. I always camped 10 kilometers on either side. I made that a point. And it's extremely important to be calm because you're going to hit rough weather. You're going to hit periods. You're going to have challenges where, where water is extremely dangerous. And you just have to be calm. Be calm and know your limits. Do not push your limits. Know your limits. Know the skill set that you have, and don't pretend you're Superman. So, would would you suggest then, Mark, that people have um, you know a trial run, a test run, before they embark on on such a a, a major expedition? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I think the only trial run that I had before I did my first six thousand kilometer expedition was three days. Right. Yeah. It's just more, 
like going back to the boy jumping off the diving board, mm -hmm. right? It's just, I just jumped into it. G get into it wholeheartedly. Get into it wholeheartedly. Plan a date and say, I'm going to do it. And then make sure that you've got all the equipment ready yeah. to go and, and practice. Uh, the, the, first, the, first, uh, the first tour I had, I trained for a year. I ran uh, 10Ks three times a week. And that was just for discipline. That was just, I hate running. I hate it. Yep. But I ran because I forced myself to get to the finish point. I rode three times a week, also 10 kilometers, um, at a, you know, at, at a, a training center. I just rode just to, to get my cardiovascular system, mm -hmm. to get my muscles in, in order. And then I also was, uh, took yoga, bending and stretching, you know, because you're yep. sitting at a 90 degree angle. And... Uh, you know, that, uh, that's not a great angle to sit in for a long period of time. I think times. before we sat down, you, you, you'd mentioned that um, occasionally, surprisingly, it's your legs that, that cause you grief. They, they, they can begin to, to ache or to cramp. Yeah. So uh, in this, this one, this tour here, I think I've paddled longer days, longer hours. And I noticed that my heels, they're, they're, they're sore, the heels. It's mm -hmm. like the cushions in your heels. It's like bed sores. Yeah. So, so I've got to move and I've practiced now. I've practiced actually lifting my legs up and laying right down on the kayak with my head back, stretching and stretching forward, stretching backwards. And then sometimes I, it's like I, like I pedal with the kayak. I press and I pedal and I paddle and I'm pedaling with my feet. So you keep the circulation going. Yeah. And that helps a lot. All right. Yeah. And um, it, it, it may be too soon to ask you this question. Yeah. Because you're maybe a, a quarter of the way into this particular trip. But do you have any plans to, um, to top this epic trip in the future? <laughs> when I was finished with the 6,000 Oslo Athens tour, I said never again. And it went four years, and uh, I started a new, a new journey. So, in a way, I feel like the force gump of kayaking. But actually, I'm a real person. But even though I don't have, you know, you know 150 people running with me, uh, there's a lot of people following me. But I actually feel like force gump. And uh, the, the, the theme of this tour is reverse the bad. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people, I want to talk about life. I don't really want to talk about business. I want to talk about values. I want to talk, what, what is it that makes us tick? I encourage a lot of people to, you know, every, behind every face is a story. Behind every smile is a story. And for me, it's important that I encourage people to let go of the past. If you've experienced challenging things in the past and you've been able to come through it, Try and help somebody who's experiencing the same thing. Try to reverse that bad that, that's happened in your life. And for me, um, humanity is, is, is key. Um, my, my fellow neighbor, the people that I meet, uh, you have to be, have your antennas open. And sometimes people reach out to me and they lift me up. And I'm ever so grateful for that. And other times, I'm the teacher. Right. Um, you know, and we need to connect. We need to connect with people. And today, after COVID, a lot of people are still, you know, hidden in their homes. And they find it difficult to get back to work. But we need to connect. Connection is a part of humanity. Connection is part of who we are. Yep. And we need to be with people. And uh, I, really, okay. I really enjoy people. Well, it, it, you, you've given me a, a wonderful segue because what I'm going to ask you to do now, if you won't find it too distressing, and I mean, please say if you do, yeah. if you'd like to look directly into camera yeah. and uh, send a greeting in Norwegian yeah. to all your family and friends and, and indeed the staff of your company. Yeah. Okay. It's very hyggelig. Mike has uh, a little interview with me. And so I have a list of to say hi to all of you who are at Um, jeg er virkelig savner familien min, og faktisk familien min er også de som har jobbet med i over 25 år. Så um, alle, de som, alle dere som er hjemme, um, husk at jeg vet du er med mig, men også at jeg er med dere. Så, um, så har det gått, og vi fortsetter å, å gå videre. Takk skal du ha. Mark Irvin, thank you very much.
Pleasure. There'll be a link in the description below to, uh, to, to take people to your vlog. Yeah. And I uh, wish you every best, every best uh, day in the future. Yeah, thank and you I so much. And I look forward to following your, uh, following your exploits. Yeah, and it's a, it's a pleasure just to talk to you, Mike. And you're, you're a good guy. I like that. Thank you, my friend. Yeah.